Our next speaker is truly a world-class cybersecurity expert. He's one of the most recognized tech speakers from Finland globally, and he will be speaking about cybercrime and finance. Welcome, Mikko Hyppönen, the Chief Research Officer from FSecure. Hello, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Mikko Hyppönen, and I am the Chief Research Officer for FSecure. FSecure is one of the largest security companies in Europe, and I've been part of the FSecure story for 29 years now. I joined a small local Helsinki-based startup in 1991, and I'm still working at the same company today. And 29 years is a pretty long time in IT business, but it's an especially long time in IT security. When we think about the enemy we used to fight in the early 1990s, it couldn't be more different from the attacks that we see today. Back then, early virus writers were teenage boys who were writing viruses for fun. And when we look at cybercrime today, there's no fun around at all. Almost all of the attacks that we see in our labs around the world are coming from money-making criminals. Money is the thing that makes the world go around. And we started to see the, the first for-profit malware attacks around 2003. And during these years, we've seen a wide range of different kinds of attacks. Pretty much any mechanism we can think of which can be used to make money online is being used by online criminals. Before the internet, we only had to worry about the criminals who were close to us. Today, that doesn't matter at all. Today, the most likely crime that we will become a victim of is no longer a crime in the real world. You see, when we leave the real world and we go to the online world, we're no longer in our countries. We are on the internet. We are somewhere which has no borders, has no distances and has no geography. Internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime. Internet is great. It has given us so much good, so much business, so much connectivity, so much entertainment, but it's also exposing us to the kinds of risks we couldn't have imagined. And when we think about technology as a trend or as a, as, as a um, thing that sh shapes our economies and our societies, when technology is good enough, we quickly become dependent on that technology. Eventually, we won't be able to live without that technology. Eventually, our societies won't be able to function with that technology. And I'll give you an example. Electricity. Electricity or the electric grid is obviously taken for granted today, but actually it isn't that old. I'm coming to you from Helsinki, Finland. The first electric grid in this city was made in 1870, which is 150 years ago, which really isn't that long of a time. But during those years, our society, like any society, has become completely dependent on electricity. If you imagine power going out for, let's say, half a year, this society would look completely different. Because without electricity, we can't work, we can't move, we can't make food, we can't heat ourselves. And this kind of a shift is right now underway with internet connectivity. Today, if we lose internet connectivity, it's pretty bad, it's a nuisance, but clearly it doesn't shut down our societies. However, eventually it will. In 20 years, in 30 years, we'll be exactly as reliant on internet connectivity as we are today reliant on electric grid. In fact, I claim that eventually, if the internet goes out, the power will go out. That's how interdependent these systems 
will eventually become. And the job of us security people is to try to prevent that from happening. And this isn't an easy job to do because when we do our work, when we try to prevent attacks from happening, it's sort of like playing a game of Tetris. Security Tetris. What do I mean? Well, we all know the game of Tetris. We know the rules. We are trying to build these whole lines. And when we succeed, the success, the whole line disappears. So our successes disappear, but our failures pile up. This is what my job looks like. Whenever we succeed in what we're trying to do, nothing happens. If we are 100% successful, nothing is going to happen. However, if we fail, then it's very visible. If we fail, the end result is data breaches, data leaks, malware outbreaks, front page news. That's just the line of our business. We are invisible until we fail. And when we look at the failures that are going on around us today, these attacks are being fueled by online criminals. Criminals who try to gain access to our corporate networks and our enterprise, enterprise systems to gain access to financial data, to lock our systems with ransom trojans, to launch denial of service attacks, to take down our online shops and then demand a blackmail payment, or ransom trojans which lock systems. Any mechanism which can be used to make money is being used to make money. And when we think about particular problems, like, for example, banking trojans, that's a great example on how the attackers will go after the weakest targets. Banking trojans have been around for years. However, these malicious malware systems which are targeting banks don't actually try to infect the bank's own systems. No, they try to infect the bank's customers' systems. Why is this? Because banks put a lot of effort into safeguarding and securing their own networks. They run these extensive mainframe-based systems, which are very hard to breach. So the attackers typically don't even try. If you are an attacker, if you want to break into a bank and steal a million dollars, you can either try to break into the bank itself, which is very hard, but if you succeed, you'll get your million, or you can try to gain access to the systems of the bank's customers. For example, home computers, which are really easy targets because they run Windows XP and have no firewall. However, if you gain access to a single home system, obviously you won't be able to steal a million because they don't have a million, but they might have a thousand dollars. And if you have a thousand victims, that's 1,000 times 1,000, that's a million. This is why we see banking Trojans going after home systems or systems of small and medium-sized companies. If they can't steal a lot of money, then they need a lot of victims. Unfortunately, it's easy for them to make a lot of victims. And banking Trojans get the money by inserting extra transactions into real banking sessions. So you go online to pay three bills, but when you're actually paying your bills, you end up paying four bills. You just don't see the fourth bill on your, bill on your screen. It's in, inserted automatically by a Trojan running on your computer. And when we look at enterprise systems, it's crucial that the computer is being used by companies that are the particular ones which are used to, to pay the bills for that company are safeguarded because those particular systems are the key systems for banking Trojan attackers. Another huge trend underway are ransom Trojans. Ransom Trojans don't try to steal anything. Instead, they lock you out of your own data. They encrypt your files, then they demand a payment from you in order to get a key, a decryption key, which will give you your own files back. And ransom Trojans are using a, a very old idea, which we've seen in malware and malicious attacks for years and years. The idea is that you steal valuable information 
and then you sell that information to the highest bidder. You steal information, you sell it to the highest bidder. We've seen this for years and years. And the innovation in ransom trojans was that the attackers realized that quite often the highest bidder is the original owner of the information themselves. You steal the information, then you sell the information back to the original owners. You lock companies out of their own files and they will pay you money to get their own files back. This is what ransom trojans do. And the real explosion which made ransom trojans the biggest malware problem around right now started seven years ago when we saw a ransom trojan called Crypto Wall, which was the first trojan which was demanding the payment to be done in this new currency called Bitcoin. Bitcoin, which is now more than 10 years old, quickly found use within the criminal underground. And today, all ransom trojans demand the payment in Bitcoin because it's much harder to track the money movements in the blockchain network created by Bitcoin than in any other payment mechanisms. This, of course, doesn't mean that Bitcoin would be criminal or bad. It's a tool. It's a tool which can be used for good or for bad. And today, some ransom Trojan families are so targeted that they might even uh, pick specific business lines to go after. For example, we're right now seeing attacks from the Egregor ransom Trojan family, which is especially targeting uh, retail chains and cashier systems so far that when it infect, infects a cashier network, it will print out the ransom note from the cashier systems themselves. There's an endless line of a ransom note coming from the cashier system, which explains how to pay the ransom if you want to get your systems back into use. And right now we are seeing the next shift, a shift which I call ransomware version 2. This shift is happening because companies are getting better in recovering from ransom Trojan attacks. Companies have realized that they really need to have good backups. Backups which are frequent enough, which cover all the data, and which are stored offline so a ransom Trojan in the network won't be able to corrupt the backups. Slowly but surely companies have learned, and this means that less and less companies need to pay the ransom to get their own files back because they now have good enough backups. And this has created ransomware version 2. Attackers are now using mechanisms where you have to pay the ransom even if you have the backups. This was innovated first by a ransomware gang known as Maze, which operates from Moscow in Russia. In January of 2020, they introduced a leak site. They have a website just for the purpose of leaking information stolen from their victim companies. So they will hit your network, encrypt your files, demand a payment, but if you don't pay, then they will tell you that before we encrypted your stuff, we copied your email server and your document servers, and we will post these on the public web if you don't pay. And in those cases, your backups don't help you at all. Your backups don't help at all. And this mechanism has now been copied by seven different ransomware gangs, which all use now leak sites. Leak sites which, for example, look like this. This is the leak site for the Mount Locker ransomware gang. And if ransomware is the biggest money-making mechanism for malware, it's not the biggest money-making mechanism overall. Because even more money is being made by criminals specializing in business email compromise attacks. Business email compromise attacks, also known as CEO scams, have been around forever. Some will remember that these fake bills were being faxed to the companies already in the 1990s in hoping that some summer intern would just stupidly go and pay any bill which was being faxed to a company. The attacks we see today are basically using the same idea, trying to fool a company into paying bills which don't exist or paying real bills to wrong addresses or wrong places, to wrong accounts. And whenever these cases hit the headlines, 
a very typical reaction from people is to laugh about it. Like, what an idiot falling for some Nigerian scam, or how stupid do you have to be to send the company's money to some faraway place? Well, that's wrong. First of all, it's wrong to laugh at the victims of crimes. Second of all, avoiding these problems isn't easy at all. It's not that simple anymore. I can name you two companies which were hit with multi-million dollar business email compromise last year. You might know them. Google and Facebook. Both were hit with multi-million dollar hits and they actually were, were wiring, wiring money out in millions. And these companies know what they're doing. These companies have extensive security mechanisms. These companies train their employees, especially their financial employees, to prevent things like these. They still fell for it. It's not an easy problem. In many of these cases, the attackers first gain access to the corporate network, especially Office 365 or other email systems, so they can follow the email traffic of the company and learn how do things work. Like who creates the bills? How are they transferred? How are they authenticated? Who pays the bills? Who do they talk to if the account numbers change? They learn that first, and once they know everything, then they start inserting extra emails into the traffic. Those emails are coming from internal email server. They look just like any other emails. So for example, CFO sends a bill to a clerk, and a minute later, the same CFO sends a correction. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong PDF. Here's the right PDF, please use this. And of course, the modified PDF has a different account number. These are complicated attacks. And this summer we saw the Norwegian state fund being targeted by one of these attacks. They lost 100 million kroner in this particular attack. And then when the real recipients of the payments who weren't getting their payments were emailing Norfund asking for guidance, like where's the money, what's happening? The crooks saw these emails and they replied to them in the name of the company, explaining to them that uh, unfortunately the payments are delayed. This is because of the global pandemic, we're sure you understand. Which is a pretty good cover story. These attacks, which make money, continue to be the biggest problem. And they're almost always done by organized crime. But they're not always done by organized crime. When we look at nation states as attackers, countries like Russia or China or Iran constantly do attacks for the purpose of espionage or for the purpose of sabotage. However, there's also one country which does nation state attacks for financial gain. There's one country only which does that, and that country is North Korea. There's only one country on the planet which tries to fix their budget deficit by stealing from other countries with cyber attacks. We've seen this multiple times from attacks coming from North Korea, including most famously the WannaCry attack, which was a ransomware trojan created and deployed by a government. Let me repeat that. It's a ransomware trojan created and deployed by a government, not by a crime group, by a government. And we've seen multiple attacks from North Korea targeting international payment systems or targeting cryptocurrency exchanges. And especially cryptocurrency attacks make a lot of sense when you think about a country which is being, um, which is being sanctioned from all, almost all over the world. Sanctions help when you're trying to shut down traffic with dollars or euros or rubles. Sanctions don't help with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies don't care about your sanctions. So it makes a lot of sense that the attackers in countries like these go after cryptocurrency exchanges. And we've seen many of these attacks, which we attribute back to North Korea and to North Korean government. We have some details about this in a recent paper we put out about the cyber threat landscape for the financial sector. So like I said, we are playing a never-ending game of security, security Tetris, where 
our successes disappear, but our failures pile up. And we are playing this game in middle of massive technological revolutions where digitalization is changing the whole world. And when technology becomes good enough, when technology becomes useful enough, we just can't live without it anymore. Thank you very much.